Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to a special edition of the Atlantic Council Live from COP26. And thank you all for joining us uh, this much anticipated occasion uh, in global climate uh, partnership. And we've just got an amazing lineup, amazing panel. Hi, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and we're proud to be represented here at COP26 with our Global Energy Center doing groundbreaking work on climate mitigation and our uh, Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Center doing groundbreaking work on climate adaptation. And uh, it, it's really it's a two-way path, adaptation and mitigation. As the world looks on, global leaders have converged here from, in, in Glasgow for the ongoing 26th Conference of Partners. Time to act uh, on climate is now and uh, leveraging uh, the strength of global, global partnerships and collaboration is more important than ever, but not just global, but also national, also regional, and we'll talk about that. The COP presents an opportunity for further, to further enhance progress underway and identify additional avenues forward to realize the climate uh, future necessary for social, environmental, economic well-being for the global community. Yet we're also meeting here in the teeth of uh, the first energy shock of the green era, uh, and we're talking about that as well. I'm delighted to have this uh, high power panel with us to discuss the critical role of technological innovation in achieving a net zero climate resilient economy. So it's my pleasure, uh, first of all, to welcome our host, His Excellency Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al Jaber, uh, the UA. Special uh, Envoy for Climate Change and Minister of Industry and Advanced Technology. Bill Gates, uh, founder of Breakthrough Energy and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Secretary John Kerry, U.S. Uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate and of course the former U.S. Secretary of State. And Her Excellency Ambassador Rochelle Omamo, Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs for the Republic of so thank you very much. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Dr. Sultan, let me start with you. Uh, congratulations on the UAE's uh, recent net zero announcement. Uh, and thank you for hosting us here in the UAE Pavilion. It's also Flag Day, so congratulations on Flag Day. Uh, having arrived in Glasgow on the heels of your net zero announcement, can you give, give us a feeling of how you look at this conference and what uh, for you would, uh, would be success and how is it proceeding so far? Well, first, first uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and for allowing us to work with you on this very important panel. Uh, it is indeed uh, with pleasure that I welcome uh, this esteemed uh, panelist very important topic. Uh, as you rightly said, the UAE was the first country in our region to uh, make such an ambitious uh, announcement to achieve net zero by 2050. This goes hand in hand with the wise uh, vision of our leadership who have seen the writing on the wall more than 15 years ago when they took a bold step on a historic uh, 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 important step towards the future when they announced the launch of a new economic development program entirely dedicated to sustainability, sustainable development and the advancement of renewable energy and clean technology. At the time, this initiative was named Masdar, and to many around the world, it was a big question mark. Why would a major oil-producing nation proactively seek a key role in the advancement of renewable energy? To many, they thought or they viewed renewable energy as a threat to hydrocarbons, yet our leadership in the United Arab Emirates did not see it that way. They, in fact, saw it as a true, unique opportunity. Only if we were to capitalize on our deep energy expertise, our substantial financial resources, and the fact that we have been able to build bridges with countries and companies all over the world, we thought that by combining these strengths and such competitive advantages, we would play an important role in helping advance uh, the cause in addressing climate change as a global challenge, as well as advance the UAE as a true uh, responsible supplier of clean energy to the world. Net Zero comes at a time where uh, the UAE uh, has also announced its 50-year plan. Our 50-year plan with its 10 principles is very much centered around. So our Net Zero initiative comes hand in hand with our 50-year plan and the 10 principles. 
It is very much centered around human development and environmental stewardship and the diversification of our economy. We view net zero as a pure economic opportunity. As such, the UAE, when they announced our ambitious plans for achieving net zero by 2050, we thought of using and capitalizing this opportunity to extend an open invitation to the world. We did not claim that we know what it's going to take exactly every step of the way to achieve the net zero. We have a very clear roadmap. We know exactly the different work streams that we have to uh, adopt uh, and progress against to achieve such a net zero objective. Yet we thought that this would be another unique opportunity to again exemplify a leadership role uh, that the UAE has demonstrated over the past five decades and to ensure that we engage the world in helping address a global challenge by providing another economic opportunity to achieve that zero. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. You have been a build bridge builder, as you said, and you're breaking new ground. We're going to have our annual Atlantic Council of Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi in early January around pathways to net zero, so exactly what you're talking about. Uh, Bill Gates. Uh, speaking of someone who's been uh, uh, breaking new ground and building bridges, uh, you've been involved in the discourse surrounding the need for technology investments to meet the climate challenge. And just yesterday, uh, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate Initiative, or AIM for Climate, was formally launched. So perhaps you can tell us about AIM, but also in general uh, where you see the, the future for technology change in climate innovation. Obviously, we have to pursue mitigation and adaptation in parallel. Uh, the warming that we're going to see, even if we achieve our most ambitious goals, will cause great difficulty for uh, countries near the equator, particularly for smallholder farmers. So the vast majority of climate suffering will be the fact that their current seeds won't be adequate. Uh, and that will not only lead to malnutrition, that will lead to great instability. And so at this climate conference, uh, the increased focus on adaptation and the focus on innovation really come together in this AIM-4C, where uh, you know, thanks to the leadership of the UAE and the United States uh, kicking this off, I think we have uh, about 30 countries now signed up for the initiative where you make a commitment to raise your R&D uh, for better agriculture, both seeds and livestock, uh, digital mapping to help the farmers, digital advice. There's a lot we can do. And to me, the analogy is uh, similar to what where we were in the 1960s and 70s, where Asia faced large-scale starvation. And people like Paul Ehrlich wrote in The Population Bomb about how we had to have for sterilization and things. Well, he turned out to be wrong because of innovation. The Green Revolution, uh, which had both foundation and government funding, actually, actually led to the nutrition levels in Asia going up during exactly that period people have been worried about. So we now need a, uh, a second Green Revolution uh, that particularly for Africa will deal with the challenge of climate and population growth. And so directing the seed and livestock work of the countries to really have impact for those farmers, that's our goal. Uh, we made a commitment uh, to spend 315 million additional uh, over the next three years through the CG system that makes, that brings together everyone to make the seeds uh, for the developing countries. So, you know, we're thrilled about this initiative. And how does this initiative fit into your overall vision of what would make a successful COP? Well, you know, this COP, we can't say that everything announced at this COP solves the problem. But what we can say is that the increase uh, since the Paris 2015 meeting, the increase in private sector engagement, investment and innovation, and understanding the importance of adaptation, if we continue that rate of increase over the next decade, then we will have, both on the mitigation side and adaptation side, something that fits the size of the problem. It's a gigantic problem. It's easy to view it as a, a glass half full. Uh, but for any of us who are in Paris, we can see that glass filling up at, a, at an exciting rate. And you know, I both 
uh, through Breakthrough Energy on the mitigation and through Gates Foundation adaptation, you know, I'm thrilled uh, that initiatives like this are where I see the world setting its priorities appropriately. Thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, Madam Ambassador, Your Excellency, uh, you've joined uh, AIM for Seek. You're part of this. Uh, uh, could you tell us how you're viewing your role in that uh, generally and more broadly? What does uh, Kenya hope to accomplish in Glasgow? Well, I think the area of agriculture is critical. The relationship between agricultural productivity, its ability to produce food security, to create jobs, and to catalyze a green revolution for uh, uh, Africa is critical to a meeting such as this. I think even without taking climate change into account, African agriculture is already on its knees. It is smallholder dri uh, driven, mainly by poor women. Um, it is rain fed. It lacks proper seeds, proper fertilizer, uh, proper post-harvest care, and, and, and limited access to markets. So if we are going to talk about agricultural innovation, uh, if we're going to talk about the application of technology to the agricultural sector in Africa, these are the areas that we need to pay attention. And therefore, I'm delighted uh, that this is an, a focus of attention, that we are trying to look at ways in which we can use technology to improve seeds, use technology to improve soils, use technology to, uh, to improve uh, water management, and generally work towards in ensuring that the catalytic capability of agriculture in Africa is unlocked. We have to remember that agriculture is losing workers. We have massive rural urban migration in Africa. So we have fewer farmers. The average age of farmers in Africa is 65. But the question is, how are we going to maintain food security if we don't innovate? I think the time for innovation in our continent is now. We have lots of young people who can transform agriculture. What we need to do is to make ag uh, agriculture exciting, agriculture smart, and agriculture productive. So this, this is the message that we are bringing to COP26. Because as we speak as Africans, we must tell our truth. And we must ensure that our truths are heard so that when investments are made, they are context-specific and they produce the right results. Thank, thank you, Madam Ambassador, Your Excellency. Uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, you have been a leader in this set of issues for a long time. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk uh, certainly about AIM as a partnership uh, not just US, UAE with support of a number of other countries, UK, Brazil, Singapore, but really the role of these national and regional cooperation models and what one's trying to get done. We have these big global goals, but what's the role of the national and regional cooperation models in what, what you're trying to achieve? Well, Fred, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank uh, the UAE um, and uh, Dr. Sultan al Jabbar. He has been just a spectacular uh, envoy partner with us over these last months. UAE hosted the very first ever Middle East uh, climate dialogue, which involved, uh, what, four or five oil and gas producers, all of whom uh, came aboard for net zero, all of whom have been uh, really committed to the COP and to the process of uh, responsible uh, activities in all sectors. So I thank them for that, and I hap wish them a very happy, I see the banner going, happy UAE Flag Day. And I want to take the uh, liberty of awarding the very best pavilion award to the UAE. <laughs> uh, they, uh, it's the only duplex I've been in in the whole place. <laughs> anyway. Um, the, the simple reality is that uh, this challenge is so big and so urgent and this decade is so important that there is absolutely no way that we will get where we need to go unless everybody is embracing everything. So regional, national, international, 
all of it has to be at the table. And for example, we're talking about innovation in agriculture here today. Um, and the ambassador made very, very important points uh, about the realities of what's happening on the ground. We can't get to net zero if agriculture and deforestation together are not part of the puzzle here. And on the agriculture side, you know, we're losing soil on a global basis. Uh, we need to do regenerative agriculture. We need to build resilient agriculture, which means understanding uh, seeds and growth patterns, and how we're going to respond to water. We just heard from the ambassador. Uh, Kenya is rain dependent, but so many other agricultural powerhouses provide water. They've got their own irrigation systems. They're capable of doing things. Can we afford to do those things in various places? It will be innovation and, and advances that help us to do those kinds of things. So uh, President Biden, uh, together with a group of nations starting in uh, way back in the early in the first climate summit, talked about creating the uh, agriculture innovation mission for climate. This is where we're here. And that mission, we are putting a billion dollars on the table to help provide the capacity for the smart investment, the smart development. But 30 countries have now stepped up to help provide additional $3 billion, so $4 billion that are now churning away, ready to help uh, advance the innovation effort. And you have uh, some 40 non-government entities that have come together, including the Gates Foundation. You just heard from Bill what they're going to be doing, and they're going to have a series of innovation sprints so that we're racing uh, to find the solutions as fast as we can. Now, I can't sit here. I'm a true layperson when it comes to, you know, agricultural uh, innovation initiatives, although I know that we are making advances on methane in the food stock, in the food that we're providing, the diet of cattle, pigs, etc. And asparagosis may be one of the ways. It's a seaweed. We mix it in the diet, and it produces the level of methane. So innovation is going to help us absolutely harness the best energy of agriculture and probably solve the problem of workforce and capacity and other challenges that nations face. And, and we just have to understand that. We're in a race against time here. I mean, and many people say time has run out. We have a decade race to get the job done. Now, I have one piece of really good news that I just learned this morning. We've been pushing to raise ambition from countries all around the world as we come into COP. With the NDCs that are now submitted, the modeling that I have seen shows that if every nation meets its NDC, we are actually capable of reaching below two degrees. Not yet at 1.5, but we don't have every nation yet in terms of those NDCs. So that, is a, that should be encouraging to everybody. It should be the beacon that says, if we do the innovation, if we really remain committed to stay on our tracks for reducing our emissions, for mitigation, we can win this battle. And I find that extraordinarily encouraging two days into COP26. Secretary Kerry, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, let's do a quick round uh, of all of you. I'll go in reverse order of the first round. So Secretary Kerry, starting with you, and then Ambassador and uh, Bill Gates and Dr. Sultan. Uh, if you're looking, going beyond agriculture, uh, maybe you can just very quickly think about what are the biggest opportunities you see in innovation or in technology, real game changers. Are there sector-specific ideas that you're sure. picking up that are getting the most in well, interest? I mean, we can, first of all, we have the ability to innovate in every single sector of our challenge. No question about that. And on mitigation, we're, obviously people are covering the waterfront, uh, the possibilities of green hydrogen, the possibilities of battery storage of some kind, whether it's you know solid state or whatever it's going to be, uh, the possibilities of direct air capture of CCUS utilization particularly. Who knows? I don't know the answer to that. But I know, and Bill knows most of the answers to it. Uh, you know, we're, we're not where we need to be. Uh, we have to push the curve of innovation far more than we are. Now, if President Biden can achieve the passage of the legislation in the Congress, 
we will have huge sums of money, unprecedented amounts of money going into the energy department, to our laboratories, to our R&D, and we will be supporting efforts like Bill Gates's in order to push the curve of innovation. Industry, particularly, we need this. We have cement, shipping, aviation, aluminum, transportation. Uh, we, have, you know, we have this core group, steel. Uh, uh, we, we need, and we haven't paid enough attention ever in this journey. I can tell you, having been there over the last, you know, since 1988, we've always mentioned industry, but nobody has really been focusing in on what are we going to do. That has happened over these last few years. So green steel is being produced. Green cement, which actually is better, allegedly, than the former cement, is being produced. And now we have another innovation would be just a government innovation. We have a thing that we've done called the First Movers Coalition, where companies uh, and countries are stepping up and saying, we're going to be the people who help create the development of this market at an accelerated rate. So they're saying, Volvo, for instance, we will buy X amount of green steel in the fabrication of our cars. So someone innovating will know, I've got a market there. I can sell this. Somebody's going to buy it. Shipping. Maersk has stepped up and said, we are going to build 10 new cargo ships, but they're all going to be carbon free. So all of a sudden, people in the shipping business know they can develop. So I think you're going to see innovation in the technology itself, and you're going to see innovation in government and in the private sector in how they're going to do this. And the final comment is the private sector is stepping up in real and unprecedented fashion. We have asset managers, asset owners. We have banks, bank alliances, all of which are coming together now with a combination of ESG uh, sensitivity as well as business sensitivity. They see that expenses are going to go up for doing business. Trillions will be spent doing things that might have been avoidable if we innovate correctly and move uh, rapidly. So I think every sector is going to see advances in finance, innovation, uh, and I'm personally very confident knowing our history when we really put our mind to it. When, when the private sector entrepreneurial spirit gets into gear and the wherewithal is there to push that curve, uh, we have a habit of winning, of coming up with something, and I believe we will here. Mr. Secretary, thank you for that. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, what key opportunity do you see for innovation? What excites you the most? Well, what excites us, uh, coming from the perspective of Kenya, are two areas. One, the area of clean and renewable energy. Um, at the moment, in my country, 90% of our energy supply is produced from clean energy sources, whether it's hydro, geothermal, or it's wind. Uh, we want to scale up so that 100% of our energy, energy needs are produced from clean energy. But clean energy is not enough. What we must be able to do is to align that clean energy with job opportunities, with the green revolution that we're talking about, with green industrialization. So we want our green energy to be applied to invigorating our economies to create jobs for our young people. The other area is the area of the mobile phone, mobile telephony. What we have learned in our country is that there's power in your pocket if you own a mobile phone. And it's through mobile technology that we are able to engage our farmers in, in, in awareness. We are able to uh, provide credit to, to women SMEs. Uh, we are able to provide information about the weather, uh, uh, to put into place um, irrigation systems that are just controlled by a small mobile telephone application. That's the kind of innovation that we want to see on our continent because it's the type of innovation that is cheap, it is accessible, it democratizes technology and brings technology to the youth of ordinary people, particularly women. COP26 must remember the African woman because the African woman is, 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 is the way forward on our continent. She's the farmer, she's the, the, the person that deals with our SMEs, she drives our economies. So whatever applications that we are and innovations 
uh, that we begin to develop. We must develop them with a view to building inclusive societies, societies that are prosperous for everyone. Thank you for that wonderful answer. The power of the pocket and the power of the African woman. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Bill Gates, your name is synonymous with uh, innovation, with technological change. I'm really interested to hear your answer to this question of what excites you most in, in climate innovation. Well, the, you know, there's many sources of emissions, and most of those sources, the vast majority, still have extremely high green premiums. So, you know, 99.9% .9 of all steel, cement, is made the old way with huge emissions. And so we have to, only innovation will let that scale. We focus a lot on, on power generation and passenger cars where innovation has gotten that premium to be quite small. But going to the adaptation side, uh, the outlook for African agriculture without innovation is quite bleak. The population growth, and the increased temperatures in combination will collapse the current ecosystems. Fortunately, though, uh, the science of the day, particularly if it's allowed to be adopted, will let us more than double the productivity. Maize productivity, wheat productivity, uh, and the staple crops are absolutely key, key here. Also, we can change livestock's, livestock health and genetics you know, we understand heat tolerance in the various livestock areas. And so by breeding that in, we can maintain these systems even in the face of climate change. Uh, so, you know, adaptation is ignored. <clears throat> Innovation uh, is less ignored, but it's the combination of those two that I'd say, in terms of climate justice, deserves to be a priority. Thank you so much <laughs> for that answer. Uh, so, Dr. Sultan, a lot of talk about innovation. Love, as you were saying, there's a lot of innovation, Bill Gates was saying, that hasn't taken place. Is the environment right for the jump in innovation that Secretary Kerry is talking about? And if not, what needs to be fixed in the environment? I actually think that it is the right opportunity and it's the right time. In fact, what makes us be very excited about uh, our, the possibility of hosting COP28 in 2023 is the sense of urgency that we feel everywhere. There is a sense of urgency, there is a sense of unity, there is a sense of enthusiasm, there is an unprecedented excitement and alignment among many, many countries that we have uh, been in discussions with. And the fact that we in the UAE are going to be hopefully the host of COP28 in 2023 allows us the opportunity to showcase and demonstrate to the whole world what can a young nation do in helping address global challenges like the climate action uh, challenge? We in the UAE have taken head on many challenging innovative technologies. In the beginning and in the very early days of our uh, attempt to apply those technologies, everyone in the world was saying that these, are, these were more of impossible missions to achieve. And in a very short period of time, we were able to, uh, to prove the viability of those technologies and the commerciality of those technologies. And I'm here referring to hydrogen. I'm referring to blue ammonia. I'm referring to carbon capture and storage. I'm referring to the fact that the first oil and gas company in the world soon will be exporting all of its products that has been powered by zero carbon emission source of power. And that's the announcement we only made about a week ago by uh, injecting uh, nuclear power that is zero carbon and solar power, the mix of zero carbon emission power to power up all of the operations of the whole business value chain of hydrocarbon industry in Abu Dhabi. That really differentiates our products. But what a place to end it, looking at COP, uh, COP, COP 28, and uh, we certainly hope to see everyone here at uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, I, I think for the uh, greater world that watches these shows, they wonder what really gets done at COP, but a lot of it is this kind of meeting, these kinds of ideas generating, uh, uh, generating hope for the future and action for the future. So thank you so much to this extraordinary panel and for all the work that you're doing, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.